Hey, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. I'm pausing for a second, as always, just to give people a second to log in. Um, welcome back. I know we've been on break for a few months uh, for a little sort of summer break. Um, so we're happy to be back getting started again and looking towards the rest of summer and fall. So I hope everyone has been enjoying enjoying their, their summer season so far. Um, I'm about to get us going live on Facebook. Uh, so just a couple of notes for anyone who is new with us. Welcome, if you are. Um, this uh, call is being recorded. You're welcome to request the record. Ooh, that's a tongue twister. Request the recording from us later if you need to leave early for any reason. Um, and David is going to be leaving plenty of time for questions today. Uh, so if you have any questions, just feel free to send those to the Q&A box, and I will be monitoring those to give to David once he's ready to take questions. Um, a note for anybody, I, I have noticed that we've been having people sign up from not just in Virginia. This, um, everybody's welcome. We're happy to have you if you're not from the area. Just know that this is geared towards Garden Zone 7. Um, so I think that's about it from me. David, I'm happy to have you back and it's been good to catch up and uh, I'll let you take it away. Excellent. Well, it's great to be back. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, I think we left off in May and that basically is because the month of May gets so busy, busy, busy for us um, at the store that uh, I need to commit a little more time to that. Um, but here we are now in summertime, and of course, around here, we get the high temperatures, the humidity, the rain showers, all that stuff kicks in, and now we get really, really busy at the plant clinic because all the problems come out, all the insects, diseases, weeds, all that thing kind of starts to show up. So today, I do want to talk about insects, but I'm not really focusing on insects as pests. I just want to talk about insects in more general form, a little bit about the relationship between the insects and the plants, and then also between us, the gardener and the plants, uh, and kind of start that conversation off. It's always what I say, sort of think like a plant, if that was at all possible. But plants, plants originally evolved out of the water, right? Very, very, you know, eons ago, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago, plants are basically like algae um, floating around in the water. And when they actually moved out of the water and up onto land, uh, it was thought they did this basically in search of the minerals. Um, in particular, I was listening to this fascinating um, story about the role of phosphorus and its availability and thinking that, well, so plants moved up onto land, became terrestrial, um, seeking the phosphorus. This is a, a limiting nutrient to them. And then that also led to them developing roots. So you figure, hey, I'm kind of in my mind simplifying things. Say, hey, I get these aquatic organisms. They find their way up on the land that's constantly shifting and moving. It's basically barren rock. Um, they start developing root systems. And in the process of doing that, like, so you got to think like more like a plant. There's trade-offs to go with that. So now as a plant, imagine yourself where you are now anchored to the earth, you're anchored onto that stone um, by the development of the root system, but that also allows you to exist in that type of environment. But that also means you have to develop a completely different type of strategy in terms of survival, because as an animal, uh, we can move to shelter, we can seek shade, or we can, we can run to escape uh, harsh environments or migrate and move. We can run to escape predators uh, you know we chase down uh, a mate for reproduction and everything all the things that we rely on as animals for mobility is not available to plant if you're a plant you just sit there and you make adaptations uh, to withstand the environment whatever environmental conditions are as they change and the different extremes that are there um, now you become vulnerable because you're there. So yes, everything else that exists in the world wants to actually come prey on you. So you start developing strategies um, to fend yourself against prey. And so plants have these amazing strategies, which then become mostly chemical defenses uh, where they develop toxins to try to keep other animals and such from eating them. Uh, you again, in terms of reproduction, you start um, enlisting the help of other animals. 
Uh, so what they you basically starts out if you're a permanent plant and you've got insects which are in the animal kingdoms coming to feed on you. You develop your defenses, you develop your strategies, and this happens over eons and eons of time. And then you start enlisting the help of some of those insects, which really shows up when we start to not pollination. So the thing I'm trying to get at here is this relationship that exists between uh, organisms in the world and between like plants and insects that we're focusing on today. This develops over eons of time slowly and, and then you get to enjoy and explore all this in your garden today. So that's what we're talking about today. Uh, talking about insects, we're talking about their role as pests uh, in the garden. We're talking about their role as pollinators, their role as predators, and all the wonderful things they bring to life uh, for enjoyment. And you can see all that in your garden. I'm going to kick this off with a little short video we did the other day, which kind of shows an example of how I practice all this in my own um, little garden here in Centerville, Virginia. Most people are trying to avoid insects. Me, on the other hand, I do everything I can to invite them into my garden. As an example, just the other day I'm working out here and a young lady comes by to offer me a really good deal on some pest control services. My immediate response is like, oh no you don't, not around here. I get this kind of confused look from her and I said, I'm doing everything I can to provide an environment that's inviting and safe for insects to come visit. She looks at me and she says like, well, what, what about ants? I can give you a good deal on that. And I was like, no, ants are not a problem. Ants are scavengers. They're just crawling around, cleaning up debris off the, off the garden. And nobody wants them in the house, of course. So if I have that issue, I can just do a little boric acid along the entrance. No problem, I got that. She's like, well, what are you doing then? I said, well, the plants I select are specifically for the insects. So I plant, for example, things like the oak leaf hydrangea because the honeybees come to it. I plant flowers like the yarrow over there because the hoverflies come to it. And now those hoverflies are attracted to their flowers, their larvae become predators of other insect pests. So by doing this, by having a balance of different flowers and diversity in here, I'm able to create a safe environment for insects that are welcome here. I don't have to use any kind of pesticides. And what little issues do show up, I can easily manage on my own. So that's what I want to do today is kind of show you around a few examples of how we can all coexist together and it's going to give us a better, safer environment and a beautiful garden. Creating an insect friendly garden begins with the plant selection. My top criteria in deciding what to plant really is diversity. I want a diversity of flower forms. I want blooms at all different times of the season. And when I have this diversity of plants, it in turn supports a diverse population of insects. Yarrow is a fantastic example. This is a native plant that has these tiny, tiny little flowers in here. And these little tiny nectaries in turn attract little tiny flies called hoverflies. They attract little tiny wasps. And the nice thing about that is while they're here pollinating the flower, they lay their eggs and then their larvae in turn feed on other insects such as aphids. So by having these predatory insects in my garden, it means that I don't have to intervene with other insecticides. So yarrow is here for that specific purpose. Plus, I love it. Uh, coneflower. This is a plant that many of us know because it's now available in a lot of different colors. And it is a tough, sturdy plant and will bloom for you all summer long. What's nice about this, this what we call composite bloom, is this is composed of, again, little tiny flowers so if you're a bumblebee or a butterfly you can land you can park yourself here take a rest and actually feed for nectar and pollen on that collection of flowers that are found in the head down in front of it i've got the black and blue salvia this is an annual so i do have to replace it each year for us but i have to have it because i've got a hummingbird that will come here every evening to see what flowers have opened and tap that one for nectar. And of course, who doesn't love having hummingbirds? Right below it, you'll see I've got the perennial salvia. And feeding on today is I've got the bumblebees. Again, this is a small bloom that allows the bumblebees to get in there 
and search for the, for the nectar and the pollen, which they'll pack up and take home with them to start to feed their young. And also helps the plants in terms of producing seed and reproduction. Dill, I let dill just grow at random. I seeded it into my garden about two years ago and each year it just self seeds and comes back. Personally, I don't cook, so it's not there so much for me, but it's there specifically because this is a great larval food for the, uh, the black swallowtail. Their caterpillars will feed the, on this. And then we get to enjoy the adult, adults. The butterflies fly around. They have plants like penstemon and, and the um, turtle head and stuff to feed them. And then when they flower, they again have these little tiny nectaries that provide a good pollen and nectar source, both for these little tiny hoverflies and other bees that are there. So by incorporating all these flowers at different times, uh, it creates a great environment for the insects to live in. It creates a great source of enjoyment for me and watching all this happen and learning about it. And it helps support a healthy ecosystem. If you're interested in having a more insect friendly garden and have any questions, please stop by to see us where our plant specialists are always ready to help. Great. So what I'm talking about in that video and we're talking about today is really trying to look forward to insects in the garden. A healthy garden should be full and teeming of life and insect life in there. So when you see an insect, don't, uh, I have too many people I think have this sort of instinctual reaction of either fear or desire to kill, but let's really try to try to look at the insect and take a little bit broader view and think first and decide before we take any action on that. So we had done this, uh, made that video really during the pollinator week. And that's probably the thing that's um, most widely known or seen as far as the insects um, and their role in the ecology of the garden. Uh, so this is a, a bumblebee that's just, you can see it's just dusted in pollen, coated in pollen uh, right in here. And that's on a, a type of honeysuckle shrub called the diabella. And what's going on here, and this is again, just looking at the biology of it. When we say pollination, specifically what we have to do is the, the pollen, this little powder, needs to actually be transferred over to a different flower um, to pollinate and lead to fertilization and production in the seed. So that's exactly what this is all about, it's reproduction for the plant. Now what plants have done, uh, because again, in terms of reproduction, they're stationary. They got roots in the ground. They're not able to go out traveling around to find a mate. So what they have to do is they need to bring primarily insects. Now there's wind pollination and animals that pollinate. There's all different strategies, but primarily this is the role that insects play in the process. So first the plant is advertising, right? It's creating a colorful bloom or dramatic bloom or a fragrance or is putting out notification that here I am to attract the insects over to it. Then they also want to offer a reward, which is predominantly in the form of nectar. So they're advertising the insects, here I am, come on over, offering you a free meal of nectar, which is a very high energy, sugar, high sugar content um, food source for the insects. And as they go in and feeding on the nectar, um, all this fur basically that's on the bumblebee is collecting that pollen. Now, as they move over to other flowers, they are transferring that pollen around, which is leading to fertilization of the plant and then the development of the seed that's going on there. So this is just this beautiful relationship and, and many like bumblebees example, the females will gather up that pollen and take it back to the hive to feed their young because the pollen is also very um, high in protein, dense in protein for them. So again, flowers, we enjoy that. As gardeners, we get carried away um, loving all the beautiful colors, the fragrances, the different forms, the shapes. Um, and we should enjoy that and be enticed to it. But understand those flowers, the plants aren't really there serving us. As the gardeners, we are serving the plants. And those flowers are there for the sole purpose of attracting insects to it. 
Now they've developed these um, specialized ways of doing this. And an example of insects, they'll have these very complex mouth parts. Uh, the bumblebee has its a fairly long tongue, which allows it to reach deep inside flowers to, to access the nectar that's in there. But in the case of like this plant, this is a Menarda, the, the bee ball. This is this long tubular shaped flower. The nectars are based down in the bottom. Bees cannot reach down here to access the nectar. So what they're doing in this case, you'll see they are circumventing that, the bees going down there, they're cutting a little hole into the base of the flower where they can access the nectar. So, and uh, a lot of times we call this robbing the flower because here the bee is taking the nectar, it's stealing nectar, but it's bypassing all that role of pollination. So again, it's wonderful to watch all this, but again, the bee is not, it's not helping out in this case. Uh, what this flower really needs is something more like a butterfly that has a longer proboscis or even a hummingbird because the pollen is located up here, not down in there. And so this is stuff that I think is just fascinating uh, that gets so much enjoyment out. Now, this is the um, cone flower. Uh, which I'd mentioned, this is in the um, aster family. And I've got, happened to get a little video of this skipper butterfly at work. Now you can see that this um, skipper has that long proboscis. It's able to reach deep into the flowers and tap them for bloom. But what's neat on this type of flower, each one of these little orange dots is an individual flower. That's why we call it a composite flower. It's surrounded on the outer part by what would be recalled to it as gray flowers. So each one of these is connected to an individual bloom. And then there, so these flowers open sequentially, little at a time, you know, each day more flowers. So this is a, a fantastic um, design for pollinators because it essentially whether you're a butterfly, a bee, uh, any type of generalist insect can come, they can find flowers available to them um, over an extended period of time, and they're relatively easy to access. So they don't got to go bopping around all over the place looking for nectar. They can come, park themselves here, tap this one flower, um, and get quite a bit of energy out of it. So any type of composite flower, anything that's in the aster family, always becomes a really great addition uh, to the garden, you know, for attracting insects. Now I put the picture of the columbine in here, partially because I absolutely love it, you know, uh, but also as we're talking about pollination, you can see the way the flower is structured with all of the, uh, the anthers, and that's where the pollen is located out here. These deep spurs that you see on the columbine, the nectar is actually tucked back here into the spurs of the flower. So you obviously, you would need um, any insect coming to get that nectar would need to have a pretty long reach to be able to get back here into the spurs where the nectar is located. Um, this flower is specifically designed to attract hummingbirds, uh, which have the ability to reach back in there. So these are a couple of just uh, simple examples I wanted to put out there about the diversity of flowers mm -hmm. and how intricately these have kind of co-evolved together to serve a different role uh, in the garden. So when we talk about diversity, um, that's what I'm saying. I want diversity of flowers, different flower types, different flower forms, different bloom seasons, and as much diversity as we can over an extended period of time provides uh, availability of food to insects over that extended period of time. Now, one of the things that happens, uh, when you create an insect friendly garden, you get all the insects you want. You get pretty butterflies and cute little bumblebees, um, but it doesn't just stop there. In this case, this is a paper wasp that we see uh, crawling out of a hibiscus. Now paper wasp, uh, they, like most wasps, I'll say, predominantly, primarily feed on protein. So their primary food source is are other insects, but they also uh, do feed on pollen and nectar to supplement their diet. So you'll see them coming to the flowers, but most often they are there in search of prey, something to go after. 
So this brings up a thing, and I put this in here because one of the concerns I hear about all the time, and, and I understand, but the concern about having bees and wasps in the garden and the risks of, of getting stung, uh, that's, that's something each one of us has to sort that out, uh, find it, figure out what's best for them. But realize that, that, first of all, really it's only the female that can sting you. Beyond that, they only do this as defense. This, um, this wasp has no interest in, in people or pets or stinging or anything like that. It will only sting when it has to defend its nest. In the case of some insects, more social bees or wasps like yellow jackets, everything, as the summer goes on, their colonies get bigger, they become more defensive on their nests. And so, so precautions are needed. But finding one here in the air in the garden really to me is a very welcome sight. And they're giving you that warning with bright markings. They're trying to give you warnings, you know, just stay away from me. You know, I do have the ability to fight back in a sense. Uh, this I put in here because this is actually a fly. It brings up an idea of mimicry. So this little fly looks very much like a bee. And that's sort of its defense. This is just as harmless as it can be. It has really no way to fend for itself. So what it's done is it's camouflaged itself to look like a bee. If you could see, and you can this close up, most insects have two pairs of wings. Flies only have one. Uh, but again, you, you can only get that most close up and stationary. It has the big eyes, a very short antennae. So most people look at that and they say a bee. But um, me, I look at it and say, hey, this is fantastic. This is wonderful. This is one of the my favorite insects to have in the garden because they're just here collecting pollen and nectar. They're not bothering a soul. They're not capable of doing anything. And again, you can see they're small. This is type of Heliopsis. I think that it's feeding on late in the summer. Um, they're tiny, but so they're going after tiny flowers. But what will happen is their larvae um, which you probably don't even recognize, and they're only going to be about three-eighths of an inch long and full maturity or something. Their larvae are amazing predators. They feed predominantly on aphids. So when you see these guys, when you see the hoverflies flitting around, that's always a welcome sign because this is where I'm talking about natural biological pest control, where you get one insect that is feeding on another insect. Um, and that makes our garden healthier, prettier, more diverse, and less work for us. Uh, just because we were talking about stinging insects, I did want to put in, because that's, it's, it's a real thing, you know, it takes precautions out there. Again, this is uh, the caterpillar of what's called a southern flannel moth. You don't even hardly recognize this as a um, caterpillar. It's just this kind of weird looking thing now, but it, what it does is it's covered itself with what looks like this fur. But when you see these type of caterpillars um, or like the saddleback caterpillar, they actually have the ability to sting also. So a lot of times they are giving you warning. You know, you see this kind of hair on them. Sometimes they're just mimicking to scare you off. But if you don't know what they are, it's best just to leave them alone. Uh, so we talked a little bit about insects as pollinators. I talked to them just briefly about them as, as predators, uh, ways that they defend themselves. Uh, this is also where they, um, an example that you probably commonly see in the vegetable garden, right? So this is the um, tomato hornworm, big sphinx moth that's out there. They'll get four inches, even six inches long when they're really hefty. Uh, they are pretty much harmless. They have what pretends to be a stinger back here. That's just a decoy. They can't hurt you at all. Totally harmless. But what I'm talking about and want to point out today are these little cocoons. So in this case, the tomato hornworm becomes the prey of a braconid wasp. Braconid wasps are very, very small, less than a half of an inch in length. Uh, and again, if you see them in your garden, that is a welcome sight. You might see them around flowers. You know, collecting some pollen and nectar is a little tiny wasp. They don't sting, sting, but what they will do, the female comes, she lays her eggs in the body of the caterpillar. The eggs 
feed on the, the caterpillar as their food source. And then here they are pupating where they form these cocoons and then they'll merge out as little adults. So if you find a caterpillar that's in this condition, you can just leave them alone. They are, they are in such horrible condition. They are not eating. You can see where they ate some foliage off the tomatoes, but this caterpillar is so severely impacted. It is not eating anymore. Its days are numbered. And this is just going to continue to add the reproduction of these um, really great insects in the garden. So again, that would be just another example of predators. So in terms of trying to put these kind of pest management schemes to work in your garden. Uh, these insects, they serve just so much purpose to us. And a lot of this we can do just by conserving. If we just don't kill them, if we allow them to exist, they will exist and they will um, aid in the overall health of your garden. And it, to me, it becomes really enjoyable. I mean, who doesn't like a ladybug, right? Here we've got, this is our native ladybug species. Uh, we had just released some in the garden, and when they come out, the first thing they want to do is they're out feeding on little droplets of water. They get rehydrated, and then they start searching for food, and their food is predominantly aphids. A uh, little side note, but if you are releasing ladybugs, you want to do that in the evening, and you want to lightly spritz the area down. I did this in daylight just so I could get pictures. Uh, the idea is after they've eaten, ate, eaten, May they found the mate, lay some eggs. This is the larvae. Again, because many insects go to this complete metamorphosis where they go from an adult to an egg, to a larvae, to a pupa, back to an adult. So it's good to know them at all stages because people will find these in their garden and without being aware of what their role is or what they're doing, sometimes destroy them. Uh, Let's not do that. These guys are voracious. Um, if, if think again, if you're like a tiny little aphid and you see this is going to look like a dinosaur coming to get you chowing down and having a meal. Um, so these are always wonderful to have out in the garden. And I've got one more to show you, um, which I'm sure you recognize. And then we will take a couple of phone calls and everything or questions if, if we have any salad. But this is the praying mantis. Uh, this is the Asiatic species. They get the biggest, the greenest that's there. Um, this guy is probably about six inches long or something. And they just, they, who knows really, but they look so self-aware, you know, they're sitting there staring at you, looking back at you. Uh, and again, what they're doing is they're using these pinchers to capture their prey. They, they stay put. They're sort of sedentary, waiting for something to enter into its field of view. They'll pounce, they'll grab it, and then digest it. And caution, uh, the next little video I have up here, you know, may not be suitable for viewers of all ages, but it's showing us a, a praying mantis that's in action. Yeah, we're just trying to get this little video to play. It's a little disgusting 15 second video, but. Can't be worse than the picture of the tomato hornworm. Some realities of gardening are, are we're learning about today. Yes. There we go. So the video pretty much speaks for itself. Uh, well, one of the reasons I wanted to show this though is uh, you can probably see right there, here's a praying mantis that's eating a ladybug. Uh, and I had mentioned earlier about wonderful predators of uh, ladybugs are. So having a praying mantis in the garden in my mind is definitely, definitely a good thing. But here's the deal, praying mantis, they're not selective feeders. If they catch a butterfly, they'll eat it. If they catch a ladybug, they'll eat it. Um, they'll, they, so they're not, like I said, they just don't target their eating. So sometimes like we sell, if you're trying to put this to work, you know, we sell ladybugs, I brought examples in here. 
like the ladybugs come, there's like 500. If we start out with 500 in the case, some of them perish in the process. So that's an, always an option, releasing in the ladybugs. The praying mantis actually come as an egg case, and there could easily be one or 200 little uh, praying mantis hatch out of this. So some people like to introduce um, insects in the garden, and that's a good thing. Uh, most of all, what I'm gonna say is, I'd like to try to create a favorable environment, uh, invite them in, conserve and protect them by not killing them with uh, insecticides, and all this stuff will establish itself on its own. But if you decide you want to introduce any of this, and to me, it's a wonderful way to introduce the, the excitement of insects to insects and young gardeners, old gardeners, everybody and alike um, enjoys doing that. And with that, what I think I'm going to do is um, see if we have any questions from our viewers or any comments that you want to share. Yeah, um, thank you, David. And uh, I'm just going to make a quick note to everybody. If you're thinking of any questions that you have, please feel free to send them in. Um, I'm going to start with questions that are directly related to insects. And then if we have questions about plants, then we'll move on to those. I know we have a few, so we'll try to get to those. Um, so we will move that direction. And we have a few questions right now, and we'll see if we get more. So uh, the first question I actually found very interesting when this came in, because um, I've actually only seen these plants indoor, these bu plants, bugs indoors. Um, what is the role of like an earwig in the garden? The, they're those little things with like little pinchers, right? They are, and earwigs, again, are beneficial insects. Um, they feed, they're basically scavengers. Um, they just scavenge around the garden. They'll feed on decaying organic matter. They will feed on other insect eggs. Uh, so they're, they're predominantly, that's why we just call them scavengers. Those pinchers at the back are really used just for mating. They're not, um, they're not harmful to people. There's all kinds of stories about them crawling into your ear at night or something. Like that's where some of these ideas get uh, happen. But they're really, they're just after decaying organic matter, crumbs, other insect eggs, basically whatever they can find lying around. So they, they do occasionally become a household um, pest, but they're usually very, very few in numbers. Okay, okay. Um, next question, what is the role of ants on peonies? That, there, there's a lot of different ideas about that, uh, and I don't have an exact answer. My, my thoughts are, so again, ants are scavengers, just fall in that same category as earwigs are. They're working the ground, they're out searching for any kind of food source, uh, cleaning up. And so when you see a peony blossom bloom, it start, has this exudate, it has this sweet, sticky um, sap, I'm gonna call it nectar on the buds. And so that becomes a food source for other insects um, and often see ants. Now there's, I don't have much belief in if there's a sort of a, a, an idea that goes around that the ants are actually necessary for opening the blossoms. I have never seen anything that kind of confirms that. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me, but that's sort of the old wives tale or, or urban myth that's out there. And I haven't seen anybody that's actually studied that. But, um, just as a backup, I'll say you'll see orchid blossoms exude um, this sticky residue. You see it on peonies. Uh, I've seen it happen to other plants. I'm just trying to come up with names of them. It, it's just, it is there as an attractant to insects, but these could be insects that help to, um, to fend off and, and protect it from other um, insect pests could be the cause. Don't really do, know the ecology of it, though. Okay. Do ants ever serve as pollinators? I feel like I've heard that for some plants they might, like ground cover in particular. They, they, they do. That's not, they're not, uh, they're not highly efficient at it. Uh, but even like I was reading thing about this, was trying to find something good about mosquitoes. I guess there are some plants that in the <laughs> tropical environments where mosquitoes might occasionally serve as a pollinator. But yes, I, I can't think of an exact plant, but I'm sure occasionally an ant would pick up some pollen and move it around. Having trouble envisioning any benefit of the mosquito, but that is good of you to try. <laughs> but it does bring up the point, like, because well, we're not just talking about pollination, but yeah. insects as primary decomposers, taking yeah. material, shredding it down to smaller size, relocating it, taking it into the ground, facilitating the decomposition, the building of soil. I mean, here, here's some decomposers and scavengers that we're talking about. 
they're extremely valuable to our ecology. Yeah, and I'll say mosquitoes are the bottom of the food chain, which is fairly important. Um, all right, next question. We actually have two related questions on the Japanese beetle, so I will ask you both at the same time. Um, the first question is, what do larvae of the Japanese beetles look like uh, so that we know what to get rid of? The second question is, is there a benefit to the Japanese beetle, or is it all downside? Uh, so Japanese beetles, and there, there's, I'm going to, my little short talk here, is we actually have about six different types of what we call white grubs or scarabs. So their larval stage uh, is below ground, and they're feeding on plant roots. So as a gardener, that's not really good. Uh, you will find them in pots, vegetable gardens, flower beds, but where they concentrate most are in lawns and turf because that's where the, the very dense, extensive fibrous roots are available. So let's say what they're doing right now, Japanese beetles emerge, they're flying around, they'll spend about four weeks as an adult where they are wreaking havoc, eating your roses and cherry trees, mating, and then they'll lay their eggs and be gone kind of by the end of the month. So those eggs then are hatch within about 10 days. They feed down in the soil all the way through the hibernate in the winter and then come back again to visit us next summer. It is an introduced pest. Um, so it's not a part of our natural ecology. And I don't want to say that there's a lot of benefit to them, but they also have a lot of predators. Birds will eat Japanese beetles. And as a larvae, um, anything from skunks and fox will feed and prey on them. So they, they do serve a role in the food chain, but I'm not trying to encourage anybody to protect and preserve them. Don't try to keep them around. Okay, not technically an insect, I don't think, but close, no, definitely not, but close enough. Um, will praying mantis eat slugs? What's your opinion of placing beer near plants to control slugs? I've never heard of that, yeah. but I know slugs are... I have never seen a praying mantis eat a slug, and I think that it might be difficult because again slugs they cover themselves with that slime essentially they're breathing through their skin so they have to stay moist uh, they have to keep that slime cover on their skin and that's why they're mostly out foraging at night um, or in very cloudy wet environments uh, of course the slugs can do huge devastation in the garden uh, putting beer out as a bait does work uh, you can just put a shallow dish of uh, beer. The slugs go to it. I don't know exactly what it is they're attracted to. I mean, I drink beer, you know, pretty routinely. Probably maybe there's a connection there. But when they enter into the little dish, they drown. What? Um, so I, I'm, I'm like, hey, if that's what you want to do, go for it. I prefer to use, there's a product we sell called Sluggo, which is a slug bait. Literally, it's little pieces of pasta about the size of rice. You can sprinkle it in your garden and it uses iron phosphide, which is toxic only to slugs and snails. So it works really well. I've been used it for many, many years in my garden. It's completely organic, child safe, pet friendly, it can be used in vegetable gardens. And I don't have to go around disposing of a little dish of slugs the next morning, which is a pretty disgusting task. Yeah, I would want to avoid that. Um... Okay, next question. How how do you combat honeydew on crepe myrtles? Are there any beneficial insects you can introduce to combat honeydew? So the honeydew is, is a byproduct of insect feeding. And we've got a, so two, two different insects. Um, with crepe myrtles, right now, um, crepe myrtle uh, aphid is available. This again, is an introduced species of aphid that is specific to crepe myrtles. And if you look on the underside of the leaf, they're pretty well camouflaged because they're almost the same color as the crepe myrtle leaf. Um, but what they're doing, their mouthpiece is sticking into the leaf and it's sucking sap out of it. And then it's secreting that honeydew. And then you start getting the city mold and everything goes with it. There are a lot of predators um, that feed on, on these aphids, which honey, uh, the um, ladybugs are very good. You know, praying mantis would, would do that if they catch them, but for really about smaller prey, 
there are those burkhanid wasps, parasitic wasps, the hoverflies. Everything I talked about today is a predator of those. Uh, beyond that, one of the things I did want to talk about that today is sometimes if you feel a need to intervene, uh, there are natural products, things like, you know, I'm just showing you insecticidal soap. These are some, what I'm talking about, some of our least toxic control options. I also am a pretty big fan of different oils. So if I'm going to intervene, um, I would rather intervene with something like soaps and oils. Now, these are still insecticides. Um, and if I spray this on a ladybug, you know, it would kill a ladybug. However, if I'm careful and use a lot of judgment as to when I use it, direct it really on the pest, there is no residue um, that's leaving us. So we can minimize, really reduce any kind of collateral damage. Okay. Long, long answer here. One, one last thing I have to say though, because a bigger problem is we now are dealing with this called a crepe myrtle bark aphid or, or bark, uh, bark scale, crepe myrtle bark scale. It's along the branches and stems of the plant. It covers itself with a white cotton coating it has the same piercing, sucking, feeding habit as the aphids do, um, but they can be more difficult to control because they're covered in this protective covering. Uh, uh, oil would get would help if you can get contact on there. Right now, we are seeing natural predators. We're seeing some of our ladybug larvae that are feeding on these crepe myrtle bark aphids, but it's a new pest. Um, I think it's going to take time, but you'll see our natural predators eventually over a period of a few years, I think, will develop an appetite for this new pest and bring it under control. But in the immediate short term, you may have to resort to spraying. Okay. Um, can we talk a little bit about, this is a Facebook question. Um, if you need to get rid of like the Japanese beetle, but you want to make sure that the bees aren't harmed in that process, can you talk a little bit about um, protecting the bees when you're applying products to control for bugs that are harmful, like the Japanese beetle? Yes, yes. Um, thank you for that question. I, I wanted to talk about all this stuff because there are times when we intervene. First of all, so the bees um, are active during the daylight and when temperatures are above 50 degrees. So bees essentially return home for the, for the evening. Now that's not, there's always exceptions. Uh, Sally and I are talking about sometimes bumblebees literally just sleep, they'll camp out and sleep on the flowers, you know, and so you'll find them out there doing it. Um, but the, the majority of them essentially return home uh, for the evening. So if you are spraying, and even if you're using these least toxic options, I wanna do this very early in the morning or later in the evening, you know, towards dusk, when there's you know, little or no activity from the pollinators and beneficial insects. Um, and then we also use the least toxic options that are available. I'm gonna tell you that the thing, that, um, and, and I know I'm doing all the talk to run out of time, but so much of this has to do with our attitudes and what, what your level of acceptance or damage is. So I have, um, I put together a little um, window box for pollinators on my back thing I've got, the uh, bat face kufia and you know some agastache and uh, a couple other flowers in there. Well, they, the uh, the uh, Japanese beetles are eating on my kufia plant. So right now I'm just hand picking. It's only one little flower I can manage at hand picking. I'm choosing to accept some damage, knowing that that beetle is going to be around for about a month. It's ugly. It's unsightly. It's a nuisance. But just living with it is oftentimes an option that I think we should consider more on. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, next question. Um, I love this one. How do I get more fireflies in my backyard? Is there a way to attract fireflies to your yard or anything that we can do for them? Uh, you know, and this, this, is, this is kind of an awful thing to say, is what we need to do is just stop killing them. Uh, as a larvae, they they exist and they live in the soil, feeding on the detritus and the organic matter. They might have, I can't remember, it's a one, even two year um, life cycle um, where they're in the soil. So what they want is undisturbed kind of woodland soil or soil. They, they would even develop in turf grass, 
But if we are constantly like we're cultivating the soil, if we're treating with insecticides, if we're doing things to disturb that environment, then we're killing the larvae. The other is that that is shown in their science is they're signaling the the lights that they produce are how they find mates and outdoor lighting is disrupting this in a very serious way and leading to decline. So during their mating season, which is predominantly in June, there are people, um, groups are trying to initiate keeping lights out, reducing outdoor lighting. I'm getting a little preachy here, but I, I live in a townhouse community. I can't stand outdoor lighting, yet I pay for it with my HOA fees um, because when we have the sky lit up, uh, I don't enjoy it as much. I can't see this happening and it's really not helpful with the fireflies. So anyway, I don't know any way of attracting them, but we just create an environment and allow them to exist would be immensely helpful. Gotcha, okay. So primarily in June, especially if you're turning your lights out, stuff like that. Um, okay, we have we have two more questions. So, and it's 2.46. So if you're good, we'll go ahead and finish up with those two and then we'll wrap up. Um, I'm seeing a lot of box elder excuse me, <clears throat> box elder bugs lately, are they harmful or beneficial? Uh, so they're, they're, they're what I would classify as a nuisance uh, to a lot of times. So they, they feed pretty much exclusively on the box elder tree, which is a native tree, uh, but it's not really a, a landscape tree. So they develop in naturalized areas and they will feed on and cause damage um, to the box elder tree. What happens is though they have this um, habit where, and, and them and other what we call true bugs, they will congregate together and overwinter or hibernate together. So they, they do some damage, they're feeding on the box, on the box elder trees in spring, they kind of disperse out the landscape, but then they all convene together in large masses. And what they're looking for is a nice dry sheltered space to spend the winter and oftentimes that becomes the cracks and crevices around your door sill your window sills and this is where these insects kind of start becoming a, a nuisance pest inside they don't bite or sting or anything i understand not wanting insects in your house uh, and i think at that point in time you do need to sort of start making some choices and you can do uh, as the temperatures getting cooler, let's say, you know, October time period, maybe you just want to spray around the cracks and crevices of your door sills, your window sills to prevent, because it's, you know, whether we're talking about crickets or box elder bugs or ladybugs, a lot of these, they congregate together. They are not indoor pests. If they come inside the house, they basically dry out and die. They're just looking for shelter. Uh, but beyond that, we don't have to treat, that's the same, we don't have to treat our entire landscape, but we can target their points of entry and do that um, basically in, in very late summer, early fall. Okay, all right, last question. Um, ooh, going back to the tomato hornworm. <laughs> um, there are black specks on the tomato hornworm in this person's garden in addition to the wasps. Are the black specks part of the wasps or is that something else? So they could just be markings on the on the, on the tomato hornworm, tobacco hornworm. Okay. They, they do have markings on their body. So I think it's probably just markings that you're looking at. But if you're seeing those little white cocoons, that's the uh, braconid wasp, and mm -hmm. you can just you can just leave it be. Okay, good to know. All right, yeah, the tomato hornworms. Woo <laughs> when they get the wasp. That freaks me out a little. Um, although I know it's important. I've had a tomato plant destroyed by this one. If they gross, yeah, I just pick them off and throw them over the fence or something. But yeah, you don't, you don't have to spray. You don't have to. I yeah, just leave them. You don't yeah. have to react to these things. Um, all right. Well, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. We're a few minutes past when we usually close. Thank you guys for the nice notes. I'm seeing thank you, David, for the webinar and all your knowledge on insects. You really are so knowledgeable. Um, I do have one quick thing, David. I don't know if you ever have anyone come into the clinic with this, but one of my good friends um, came to me. People come to me when they can't, you know, they don't have you or they know me. They're like asking me questions about gardening. And he was having trouble with these worms on his milkweed plant. Um, and they were black and white and yellow and they were eating his milkweed and he had killed them all. Um, and he was devastated to find out that they were monarch caterpillars. Ooh. So 
if you guys have milkweed and you have black and white and yellow caterpillars on them, those are probably monarch caterpillars. So you probably don't want to kill those and end up as devastated as he was when he found that out. So um, just my but that's a that's a great story to end on because that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You, don't, you don't just have to respond. I mean, you, it's you always have time. It's so easy to take a picture and, and email it to us, call us, business the plant clinic. Let's identify the problem before we jump into taking any. Yeah. Treatment. He was so horrified. I just, I felt awful for him. I was like, it's okay. He's like, I'm a caterpillar murderer. I was like, you're not, you're fine. It was an accident. <laughs> just know in the future, those are monarchs. Um, so he would, yeah. Anyways, just avoid that if you want the monarchs. Um, all right. Well, David, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for all of this information. I learned so much today. I know everybody else did too. Um, so for, so everybody knows we do not send out follow-up emails following our plant clinics um, since we are on Facebook and on the live stream. But if you are interested in the recording, please send me an email or contact the store. I will get you a copy of the recording. You can find it on our YouTube page, generally 24 hours after the class. Um, what else? If you have any questions, please also feel free. Call the store. Send me an email. We're all happy to follow up with you. If you guys contact me, I will put you through to David. Unlike my friends who ask me about milkweed, I will not try to answer your questions. I will send you directly through to David so um, we can get you the advice you need. Um, David, you will be back in another two weeks. Two we are we are resuming our regular virtual uh, virtual plant clinic schedule. We are also going to have some classes in July, um, a light schedule in the stores. And then in August, in mid-August, we will be resuming a full schedule of in-store in and online classes. So thank you all so much. David, do you have anything you want to wrap up with before we close? No, it's just good to be back. Uh, there's, yeah. there's always stuff going on in the garden so i don't know what i'm doing two weeks from now but um it, it'll be easy because like i said this virtual plant clinic i do tend to focus on things that are going wrong and, and that's there's yeah. no shortage of that yes <laughs> all right well thank you all so much david have a good afternoon everybody else it was great being back and uh please follow up with us if you have any questions you want to follow up on we're like i said happy to chat have a great afternoon everybody bye all right take care everybody